We'll just let it roll. Just a second, there. Here we go, Facebook. This is your moment. Look who's here. Stay. Hi, everybody. It's Eddie Brill. You, how can you be as accomplished as you are and so nice and so humble, Eddie? Well, then I can't answer that question if that's right. <laughs> 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 I can't put me in the spot there. Um, you know, people were very good to me when I started and all the way through, and I've had an amazing mentors, you know, John Mendoza when I was really young, Robert Schimmel, the what? most, 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 and Sam Kinison, the what? crazy, crazy. And, you know, I always vowed, there's a guy named Tony V, who I think is the most talented, humble comic in the world and one of the funniest from Boston. And, we, you know, he was a mentor to me as well. So, you know, you know, we vowed to give back the same thing we got. And, you know, comics look out for each other and it's really nice, and I love comedy. I love the business, and you know, despite whatever pitfalls or slings and arrows there are, and uh, yes, you know, so you just it's 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 good. Like I I did the show the other day, and they didn't have any money, but you know, it was like they're gonna laugh and they need to laugh, and during this time, people are down, and you know, it, and it felt good. I mean, you know, so there's a selfishness to. To doing good things because it feels good. Yes. Remember that episode on Friends when Phoebe was trying to be unselfish? I don't remember that. I love that show and it was really funny. I didn't see every one, obviously. Yeah. And My she... favorite one is when she and her father and mother got caught in the shower. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> see that. Sex in the bathroom where it was, that, I think it's one of the funniest shows ever. But anyway, no, I didn't see the that one that you brought up. Yes. So, um, you know, you were born in Boston and you reside no. in, born in New York. No, no, I was born in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, what part? Bensonhurst. Oh, I lived there for a year. I lived on 86th and 16th Ave. Oh, wow. I lived on 64th Street between 19th and 20th. Not far. You know, as, a, as a little kid, I was born in Brooklyn and we moved around a lot. We lived in the projects for a, a while and... Then we moved to um, my grandmother's house for a while. And then when I was three, we moved to 64th Street. And I lived there just before my 12th birthday. And I moved to Hollywood, Florida. Wow. And, and I, went, I went to junior high school and high school in Florida. And I only went to college in Boston. A lot of people think I'm, I'm from Boston, but I only lived there for the four years of college. What college did you go? It. I loved it. What college did you go to, Eddie? Emerson. Emerson. Are you a football player? What's that? Did you play football? No, oh, Emerson was for artists. <laughs> oh. and, uh, and it was mostly females and uh, a lot of gay men and women. <laughs> and so there was really not a sports program, oddly enough. It doesn't mean that women or gay men and women couldn't play sports. It just wasn't a, a sports school. Yes. You know, I played some baseball there and we played some basketball, but... It was more almost intramural. Got it. Um, so I, it was a really incredible education. And we, Dennis Leary and this woman, Jody Hafner, and this guy, David Whiteman, and this other guy that I don't remember his name, the year before I went to Emerson, they had a little comedy group, the four of them. And they decided to start a big comedy group at Emerson when it was my freshman year. So I met them at the beginning of school, and I joined the comedy group, met all my best friends, and, you know, the the, the, um, the kind of people that were in that group, like Mario Cantone and uh, Lauren Dabrowski and Dennis Leary and, you know, all these people, they we had a very successful uh, comedy group. Yes. So, you know, my four years in Boston were amazing, and I started doing stand-up there uh, a little bit later toward the end, and but... You know, I, I did a lot of cutting my teeth in Boston, as they say, but really I'm a New Yorker. I, I, I'm 61 years old. 51 of those years have been in New York. Wow. What part of New York do you say is where you hail from? Because everybody thinks their neighborhood's better than the other one. I'm in the East Village for the last 40 years. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. So tell me... Um, you're in the thick of things with the whole virus in New York. 
So I'd like you to tell me, you know, the downside of what's going on from your observation and then maybe something sarcastic and silly that you've observed people doing because I know you're into observation and sarcasm. So you've got to have a reams of material about this. <laughs> I, it's very interesting because we don't really see the hospitals. You know, we're staying at home most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 7 p.m. every night. We open the windows and bang on pots and pans and cheer for the the workers and everything it's really kind of nice and i don't really go out much i've gone out like four times in a month and a half to you know go look at uh, groceries and produce and to just come back home and i throw out the garbage it's like a party it's like a picnic <laughs> and i'll sit out on my stoop for like 10 minutes with a mask and, and gloves but they want us inside and uh, you know new york has, is the epicenter and Yes. You know, it's pretty it's pretty intense here. New York has nearly 10, you know, we're taping this on the 23rd and we nearly have 10,000 people dead in this in New York. You know, the Bronx has the most I think the most deaths in all of America. Yes. So, but you know, you know, so it's pretty intense. My nephew had gotten the virus. He's young and he survived, thank God. I've had a couple of friends who were very very sick, a couple that have made it through a couple that didn't um so you're thankful for what you have there's a lot of stress and anxiety with you know as you know as a performer i'm dying to get on stage and yes you know i don't want to die so i have to wait you yeah know? yes but what the cool thing is the cool thing is is that the earth is resetting yes you know it, we're not using all of the fossil fuels and the the air is cleaner and you can the I'm on my stoop and the birds are singing. It's yeah. like a, it, it's like I'm out in nature and the birds are back and the you just feel like, wow, we should do this often instead of you know getting coal out of the ground and using gasoline. You know, it makes more, makes total sense what people have said for a million years. Let's you know let's be good to the earth um, yes. because the earth is you know like even Carlin had said you know. The fuck's wrong with you people? The earth doesn't give a shit about you. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you're gone, then we're fine. So we're just really guests here. Yes. And there's a lot of assholes who are, you know, ruining the, the water and the air and, and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So, um, it's kind of nice to, it's kind of nice watching the earth reset itself. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yes. Kinda cool. I got three pigeons to listen to my comedy the other day. And then they flew, they flew away. Did they, did they come back for a second show? No, they, they didn't, it, they didn't turn it into a bringer or nothing. Yeah, they flew the coop? <laughs> yes, they sure did. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't homing pigeons. Okay. You see that you've got to tie a little note to their thing and then give them passes so they can come back. There's a, there's a bunch of pigeons out here on, <laughs> on my fire escape and they're you know i hear them warbling every morning yes like i get woken up by the sounds of birds this you i'm know, hoping that too. sorry go ahead no it's okay go ahead. i'm hoping that the rest of the country the world knows that what's happened in new york is real and being away from it, it's easy to, you know, uh, come up with a conspiracy theory about Democrats and, rep and not take it seriously. Yeah, well, that's the problem. That's why there's problems in the world. Like right now, as far as the cure is concerned, China and America are having a, 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 a war on who's going to get the cure. You know, and it's not about helping people. It's more about, who you know, who is the bigger cock. And who is more in, you know, bigger ego, and who's going to make the billions of dollars that's going to happen once they find a vaccine for it. Yeah. And will the vaccine be good? And will they put too much into the vaccine? And because the pharmaceutical companies are going to want to make a lot of money. You know, it's not about, there's nothing going on with the people in charge, uh, except for the scientists. And most, and not all scientists, a lot of scientists are looking for the money and the tied to pharmaceutical companies and all that. So the, the sad part is, is that it's, it's all about, you know, that right now it's just about ego and it's not about people. Yeah. And it's always been like that and it always will be. So when we go back 
you know, there are already people are assholes are out there, and they're, we want to go get our fingernails painted, and, and we want to get tattoos, and we're sick of sitting at home, and, you know, just morons, you know, just selfish morons. And that's, we, we've grown up in a fear-based society. Yes. You know, advertising, politics, and religion, they're only successful with fear. So that's where people are. Where in comedy, the, we only fear not having stage stuff, but we actually, you know, it's a much more, the, the foundation for comedy has always been the truth. Yes. Uh, where where um, you see in government, the foundation is lies and repeated lies and manipulation. And, and it's all about making people consumers and making money. So always it's a shame. It is. But that's the way. Well, I'm not even in New York, but one day, two weeks ago, I lost five friends. So I can only imagine what you've had to experience in your family and friends. Yeah, it's horrible. It's been really horrible. I have a friend I went to college with who, you know, we went out back in the day and we were still great, great friends. And, you know, I'm just crossing my fingers. She doesn't look good. So it's very, very sad. Yes. You know, but also, and I had, you know, I, my nephew, you know, is, I, he's my godchild and he's the love of my life. And, you know, I, he, he pulled through, but he takes care of himself. Yes. He lives a life where, it, you know, um, he has a great immune system because he doesn't listen to the rest of the world and knows how to take care of himself. You know, we don't live in a world that also, you know, we make fun of people who take care of themselves. Like you're a health nut. Yes. You're a nut, you know, which is really weird. You know, it's like, you know, but that's just the way it is. And, you, you know, you, all you can do, you know, I used to be so angry and scream and yell, you know, how can you call us nuts or whatever if you take care of yourself? But then I realized all I have to do is shut up and just be an example. <laughs> I live, I'm a veteran of the Army, and I live in a veteran's village in Las Vegas on the Strip. And there's two idiots here that have the virus and refuse to stay quarantined, right? And so I had a problem with it and they said that I'm paranoid. <laughs> so it kind of speaks to yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, there's a great book called The Four Agreements, my favorite books ever. And uh, it's uh, one of the agreements is how you don't take things personally because people are projecting their fears onto you. And a lot of times when people will attack, it's mostly they're projecting their own fears and, and anxieties on you. So that's so why I don't take it seriously. I just understand that, you know, again, we've grown up in a fear-based society. Fear is the best way to get people to spend money. You know, you, you're, you're not handsome enough. You're not beautiful enough. You're, no one's going to have sex with you, you know, unless you use these products and you you know, your hair is great, and if you don't put that, you know, darkener in your hair, no one's going to be in, in love with you, and you're like, oh, I better, well, I want people to be in love with me, and it's that fear, you know, it's all that stuff that the lies and the fear, it's just, it works. It, it really does. Works. It fears that. Even, even when you're aware, like, I find myself aware, I, you're still affected by it. You are. I just realized that you're exactly right. I never noticed that before. What's that? That fear is, you know, like one of the greatest motivators in my life. You know, like I think I'm free of fear, but like, why are you dressing up? Why are you fixing your hair? I mean, it gets down to everything. Yeah, it's about, you know, like you're you get all this stuff piled on you, piled on you, all these lies intimidation and you know other people's fears and once you get rid of them all of the crap that's when you know that's when you become the best you the most you and this is the very famous michelangelo thing where he they ask him how he made david out of that marble they said well i just cut away the pieces that weren't him wow you know so that's what you do as a human being you cut away the pieces that aren't you that have been forced on you and you get rid of them and you stop trying to please everybody and you just do what pleases you without hurting other people and 
you know, and if it does hurt other people because they're too sore, you, they have to get over it because you're not living your life to please them. You know, in comedy, like, you know, so a lot of people were mad at Dave Chappelle for some of the things he said. And and it's like, look, it's that's his truth. And he was being honest. And that's his way. And if you don't like it, turn the channel. He's not here to please you. Exactly. That's not his job. Not at all. I love him because he's, you know, he's uh, he's in tune with what he's saying. And he's speaking authentically. He's and he's one of the few comics... And all the comments I've met him, thousands of them, that got it from the beginning. And uh, he, he came out and told the truth and he never stopped. Wow. And it's his truth. It, it might not be yours. You might not agree with it. You might think it's silly. You might think it's, um, you know, wrong, but, you know, tough. Yeah. Wait, what's the biggest thing that you learned along your way in comedy? Um, one of the biggest things is not to try to please people, you know, and that happens in, in life. You know, you, you want people to be pleased, but you're not trying to do that. If you do what you want to do, the thing that makes you laugh, the thing that makes the, the sarcasm, the sarcasm, the irony that makes you happy. If it makes other people happy, that's fantastic. But if you start living your life trying to please other people, you're not being true to who you are. I and, would, you know, your, your word is nothing. You know, it's like our leaders, their words are nothing. You know, they, they, so why would you, you know, once someone lives their life in a lie, including ourselves, every once in a while we lie to ourselves. We uh, pretend that we're something that we're not. Once we do that to ourselves, we're beating ourselves up for no reason. So the key is really is to just, be vulnerable because that's the strength. I love the strength that. The human being is to be your most vulnerable and uh, and be okay with making mistakes. You know, one of the worst things in the comedy world or in the entertainment world is the cancel culture. Say somebody says something when they're you know like ten years ago and it's homophobic or wrong and that's horrible and completely wrong, um, and then they evolve as a human being they realize oh my god you know that was stupid and bad and i was childish or i was a young comic and i didn't i thought the easy way to get a laugh or around my house everyone was homophobic or this well if you evolve into a person who grows from that that should be celebrated uh that should be you know you should be rewarded for evolving as a human being but what happens is, is people go, well, let's look back. Oh, 10 years ago, this guy said this, this gal said this. And they focus on the negativity because people love that to create drama that doesn't exist. So instead of celebrating how people evolve, the problem is in our society, we, we, you know, we just want to, we want to hurt people. Yes. Yes, I'm so tired of everybody looking for somebody they're better than. You know, like if one thing that this pandemic should teach us is that we're all on the same playing field. Yeah, we are. This really we brings are. it we home. Have the ability to survive if we're smart. You know, there are things that are probably going on that we don't know about. You know, there might be people spraying the air with chemicals or, you know, there might be some things that are going on that are, you know, people are using to control other people. I don't doubt that that could happen. You know, there are very smart people in the science world who can also use that science for bad. Um, but in reality, you know, science is pretty powerful. It's, it's, uh, and when people just discount science, then it just shows that there, you know, there's an ignorance or a, a negativity or, you know, we should always be progressing as human beings, as people. That's why being progressive is amazing. When you go backwards because you're scared, when you go backwards because you're afraid, that's when you lose. Wow. But you're, have you mentored people? You're so brilliant at this, figuring, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, well, you know, again, like I said at the very beginning, I've been mentored by some of the greatest people and I try to just pass it along and, and let people know that, you know, a lot of the times, like, you know, like I do a lot of workshops with comedians, but 
I don't teach them comedy. You can't teach someone to be funny. And I, and I say, I don't tell them how they have to do it or what they need to do. Or I let them know that whatever they do is what they do. But I try to let them to know to not worry so much about pleasing everybody. I mean, if you want to go into politics, you look at, um, you know, the healthcare system for the country. In order to get it passed, they had, a, you know, they tried to please people. And by pleasing people, they created a mediocre system because you were trying to please everybody, which will never happen, um, especially when money's involved. So if they would have just taken the bold lead and said, look, this is how things are going to go. And when there's mistakes that happen, instead of throwing it away, let's improve it and make everything better. Now we're suffering as people because too many assholes, you know, were in, you know, we're looking to tear things down. Yes. What's the number one thing when you're teaching somebody that just, you just want to, it's like nails on a chalkboard when a comic does what? Um, panders. When a, a comedian panders to the crowd. Meaning that they're, they're wanting to placate them to get a laugh? Yeah. I, you know, I never realized until I first went to Europe in, you know, late 80s, early 90s how much American comics pander, how much we try to get laughs based on nothing that we did, based on, you know, like, hey, let's hear it for the troops kind of thing. Well, why are you using the facts of the troops to get your applause break or laugh? You know, it's a lazy, horrible way, um, un non-creative way to get it. But if you're funny and you get a laugh, uh, that's really good. You know. I, you know, I'm not looking for applause. I'm looking for laughter. And a lot of comedians, a lot of American comics, and and also some European comics, they're basically pandering to get the audience to love them. Love me, love me, love me. And that's very unsexy. Yes. So have you done comedy when you've been around the world? You've done Europe. You've done, uh, shoot. I've been in Bangladesh doing comedy. I've done it in Australia. I've done it in France. I've done it all, you know, in many, many incredible places. Australia, which was incredible, and Hong Kong. Is have you done? Have you done the troops, like USOs? Uh, you know what? In America, I have, but I haven't. You know, when I, I was working at Letterman for nearly two decades. I'm jealous of that. I'm jealous. Yeah, I understand. I'm jealous of it too, and I did it. <laughs> It was pretty amazing, you know, to be on that stage every night with that man. Gee. You know, it was pretty incredible. And I, so, you know, during the time I was at Letterman, which was 97 to 2014, that's when I got asked to do the troops a lot. And I couldn't because of working at, at, the, at the theater. Um, you know, Drew Carey brought a bunch of people out. And it was going to, that was going to be, I would have loved to have done it. But I have done it for American troops. That's awesome. I've done um, my own little tiny shows on the West and East Coast for military and vets. It's pretty darn rewarding. Yeah, Very. it is rewarding. Yeah. So I'm also jealous of something else on your bio that some people might not know about. And if they do, it's obscure now. Reader's Digest. Oh, my God. Oh, that's so... Yeah, I... Um... I fell into that job and it was really fun. The, uh, there was a competition sort of just to, a promotion uh -huh. and they were going to be doing, you know, like citizens were going to tell jokes and Reader's Digest was going to have them tell their jokes on stage at Caroline's and they were going to have, you know, guest comedians who were going to do real jokes or whatever and real material and Jeff Frost was going to host the event wow. and I was going to be a judge you know it was kind of just window addressing to be a judge <laughs> and they were using the Letterman name pretty much to oh here's the guy from Letterman let's get him to judge and then it was so it was a bunch of us judging and Jeff got some kind of like hip replacement or or some kind of injury Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, he, he, it's so funny because he's such like an old comic, he even has old comic injuries. <laughs> he had, uh, he had, and so they said, look, will you take over? So I took over last minute and I hosted and I said, look, the show needs, is not really set up well. Let me, 
we need another comedian, blah, blah, blah. And I, I said, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me, you know, but if you like it, then you have to use me all the time. And then I said, it went really, really well. And then um, I started booking shows for, through them for St. Jude's. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was star studded audiences and I brought all the best comics in the world, like Caroline Ray and Rich Hall and Greg Giraldo. And, you know, it's just like all Wendy Liebman and, uh. you know, it was just so beautiful to have all these incredible comics perform for, you're in, in the audiences, Alan Alda and Elaine May, and, you know, all, it's just, it was an incredible run. And I would write articles about up and coming comedians for them. And they had a comedy issue every year that was very, very good. And so I would help them to, you know, look at uh, future comics who, you know, a lot of them who ended up doing very well for themselves. You know, Corey Kahaney and Tommy John again. And I would, uh, you know, I just would mention these comedians when they were young and put their name in the thing. The only negative thing about Reader's Digest is sponsored by mostly pharmaceutical companies. So when I wanted to put a health um, article in there, uh -huh. uh, they wouldn't. They, they they couldn't do it because their advertisers would be angry. <laughs> and, you know that, that's business. That's yes, business work. So. Eddie Bobby Collins is on here. As many many top stars are watching, Kenny Ortega is listening. Julia Scotty, the list goes on. But Bobby Collins wanted to say hello, Eddie, and how is your mother in Florida? Well, my mom. Uh, passed away um, uh, about, about four years ago. I'm so grandma. sorry. He, you know, Bobby met my stepmother, and I think that's what he's talking about. And she's she's actually been ill as well lately. Yeah, I, yeah, my, I, Bobby was my step my mother went to a show where he was at down in uh, Florida, I think. Okay, and she's okay. And Julia of Julia, I have I we ran into each other a lot. Lot. We knew each other years ago, and then we've been running to each other a lot, a lot, a lot. And Bobby says he's so sorry. He says, "Oh yes." So he, I'm not sure which one he was, which mother he was referring to, but he says he's so sorry about your mom. Well, tell him thank you. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, her. Let my stepmother know. I <laughs> guess. So, what's the, if you could get out of your room right now and not be grounded and punished by God? <laughs> and and money wasn't an issue in the entire world. Who would be the where'd the first place be that you'd want to go make people laugh? Um, right here in the city, right here in New York. You know, because it's. I mean, I just love New York City like crazy. I'm such. It's the motherland. It's yes. You know, even though a lot of people think I'm from Boston, even though I just went to school there. Um, I love New York, but no, I would love to go. I love Ireland. Ireland's one of my favorite places to stand up. It's a country of storytellers. Oh. And, uh, and it's really fun. They're really great audiences. And I've been, you know, I've done Dublin and Galway and Belfast and Derry and, you know, uh, all these different t towns uh, all over there. Galway, Dublin, Cork was great. And then also Australia is really terrific. I love working there. I love working in San Francisco. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really cool places. The comedy works in Denver is an incredible comedy club. The Cap City in Austin, I haven't been there in a while. There's so many great clubs. The San Francisco, you know, Cobbs, uh, it's a great club. There's so many really great clubs and a lot of really good people. The Acme in Minneapolis, the Comedy Store in London. Whoa. You know, it can go on and on and on. I've been lucky enough to go to. There was a club in Paris that was the best club in the world. And unfortunately, the building got sold and they made it something else. Why was it the best club in the world, Eddie? It was Rich Hall had got me the gig. And when I got there, the owner said, uh, look, you do 45 minutes and then we take a break and then you do another 45. I said, what? He said, yeah. And I said, it's a different crowd. He goes, no, same crowd. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, an hour and a half? I don't know if I have that kind of material for this European crowd. The, and so I called up Rich on the phone. I go, what'd you get me into? <laughs> he said, don't worry, it's the best club in the world. It's like a jazz club for comedians. He said, work the crowd for the first 45 and then take a break and then do the last 45. I do material. Uh, so I was freaking out. I had quit smoking <laughs> in those days. I started smoking immediately. <laughs> and uh, my girlfriend was like, let's go to the Louvre. And I go, you go to the Louvre, I'm going to write an act. <laughs> so I went over to the river and I sat there and I was writing on a yellow pad. 
stories I would tell from my childhood, or I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, turns out the crowds were all expats. I started working in the crowd in 35 minutes. I, well, I did what felt like 20, 25 minutes. I looked at my watch. I'd done an hour and five. Wow. And I was like, oh, my God. And then so I took a break, and I came back, and I did another hour. When I, you know, so, and every night I was there, I did like two, at least two hours. I, don't ha- I didn't have two hours of material back then, but I liked two hours. <laughs> and it was the best club in the world, and I did it a bunch of times. And there was, they, they only did comedy once a month, and they used mostly British and Australian and Irish comics. Wow. Tom Rhodes, Tom Rhodes, Emo Phillips. Don't you love Tom Rhodes? Yeah, those two. We were the like four, four Americans that would do this club. And it was the uh, Hotel du, du Nord. Uh, and it was beautiful. And unfortunately, it went under. But uh, yeah, that was the best. Because first of all, you had to work to an international crowd. You know, and again, I was saying earlier about pandering. The, the European crowds, they did not put up with it. If you started pandering, they'd turn on you. Wow. Yeah. Like, if you say it's great to be here in Paris, like, fuck you. (laughs) What do you mean it's great? (laughs) Don't kiss our ass. Make us laugh. Yes. I love that. I love that. I hate it. I hate that when people start for cheap, cheap laughter. Like, show me what you wrote. Put put your hands together, uh, you know, for coming out tonight or give yourselves a round of applause for coming out tonight. Where we do it in America, we don't even think about it. But why would we applaud ourselves for coming out? We've done that before, and uh, you know, you know, it's it's just the, it's just our natural ability, our natural want to pander, to please, to uh, and you know, I the first time I was in London, I gave the MC my intro. And he looked at me like, fuck you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I got to be friends with him. And he said, I said, what was that whole thing when I, the first night? He goes, well, you came up to me and I didn't know you. And you started bragging about your career. And I went bragging about my career. He goes, yeah, you told me all the TV shows you did. And I go, no, it's just giving you an intro. He said, intro? He said, why would you have an intro? He said, you know, the crowd will know you're funny if you make them laugh. You know, we just bring comics on one at a time and, you know, I mean, they've changed since and they kind of do intros more these days, but it was kind of interesting yeah. to be over there and they don't, they, they thought I was, bra- he thought I was bragging to him like, oh yeah, well I did HBO and I did this and he was like, what a piece of shit. He looked at me like, you know, what, what was I doing? <laughs> Thank you so much for this interview, Eddie Brill. You're amazing. I'm so glad I got to know you and, and get this up on Facebook. And we're, it, you've probably been hit in the pocketbook with this whole shutdown. Do you have a Venmo or a Cash App or a PayPal that you want to invite if people are so inclined? Well, I'm an Eddie Comic, E-D-I-E-C-O-M-I-C, on most everything on uh, Instagram, uh, Venmo, Venmo and PayPal. It's AOL, so it's any comic at AOL. dot com. It's, if anyone wants to do that, that would help. I can get some more grains. I'm running out of uh, help my healthy grains. <laughs> uh, that, that, I never thought of that. That's very generous. If someone wants to be generous, that would be lovely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, any comic, E D D I E C O M I C O M I C. Wonderful. AOL. And, uh, but like on Instagram, it's Eddie Comic, at Eddie Comic. On Twitter, it's, and I only try to be funny on Twitter and not be political, it's Eddie underscore Brill on Twitter. Okay. So Wonderful. That's my things. You're awesome and you're so humble with all of your accomplishments on stage and screen and to be so humble and so kind. Thank you so much, Eddie Brill. It's very nice of you to say, and I, I had fun. I was just about to go to sleep. I've been up all night. You can see my under eyes. Yes. I, I, my hours are all screwed up because of this whole thing. Yes. I, I got up at four in the morning and I wrote all day today. I wrote a story about um, the worst gig I ever had in my life. Huh? And, uh, and I put it on Facebook today. So I'm going to go read it. Of, yeah. It's kind of a funny story. So, you know, but and it's funny now. But uh, <laughs> at the time I was a young comic and the crowd hated me and the and they were all, they were these women with the arms in a sling and 
and this one woman threw her beer who had a baby in a stroller and a beer in the other hand and she threw the beer bottle at me and, <laughs> and it smashed against the wall and splashed my whole clothing and a glass in my hair and I was on a first date who I never went out with again <laughs> but, you know but you know I'm still alive so I can tell the story I can't wait to read it I'll go read it Thank you. Oh, nice to talk with you. Nice to talk with you too. God bless your family. I guess your mother and your mother um you know, I, stepmother. I lost, I've lost, I lost my sister when she was thirty four. My brother, one of my brothers when he was thirty five, my stepfather was thirty seven. My mother young, my real father young, uh it's it's been intense. I have you know, my nephews and nieces from the people who had passed and we're a very close family where we have a lot of love and my sister who died, her son got the virus, so we're so happy that he survived it. And, uh, you know, and also, um, I'll try to, if we can put this on Facebook so I can get people to watch it, that would be cool. Yes, I'll go, we're not friends on Facebook, so uh, I'll have to so try to- change that, you just send me the, the request and, okay. and then you can put it in. Okay, got it. I don't even have many spaces or else I would offer it to, the public but i only have like seven spaces on facebook open but okay. um but all those on instagram you can have a million you know. yes perfect let's get out and let's support eddie brill on instagram and do you have anything any merchandise you're selling eddie i don't i'm very old-fashioned with with merch you know which is you know not in the most intelligent way to be but I just never wanted to carry stuff with me when I traveled. So um, I always want people to come and see me live. But just, you know, if, like you said, Venmo and uh, PayPal, I won't turn it down. Okay. I'll be very thankful, especially during this rough and tumble time. Yes. Um, I'll... But other than that, just say hello more than anything and uh, then come see me when I do stand up. You got it. And I'll get other people on board with that because you're quite the guy. And people love you. People have nothing ever to say negative about you. And a lot of times your name I'm has sure come up. I'm sure people can find you. <laughs> <laughs> I've booked comedy for many, many years. So when you book comedy, even people who don't know you hate you. So it's kind of funny in retrospect. But uh, you just have to believe in yourself and and also listen to people because sometimes you're an asshole and you have to, have to learn from it. And, that's a good point. You know, whatever. But anyway. Yes. Um, yes, that's I, a good I, point. I, want, I, wish you, I wish you to be safe. Thank you. Healthy. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll, I'll see each other and tell Gladys I said hello next time you talk to her. I will do that. I always love Gladys Simon. She's my rock. Thank you so much, Eddie Brill. She's, she's phenomenal. Take care of yourself. Bye, Linda. Bye, bye Eddie. Love you.